Hi, um, I want to welcome everybody to our third uh, plastics conference, A to Z plastics conference. And um, a lot of us have been on the first and second one. This topic will be about the environment. And we're going to have Justin Noble and Wilma Supra. Uh, I've not heard Wilma talk, but I have heard Justin talk before in Belmont County. And I live one county away from Belmont in Harrison County. And my husband and I thought we were going to move to Christine, Ohio, but we're ending up living pretty much in trash land right now. But we'll talk more about that later. Um, but I'll hand it over to BJ. Are you, let's see where BJ is. Are you ready, BJ? I am, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, BJ Brenda Jo McManama. Uh, my day job, well, sort of my life too, is, is working with the Indigenous Environmental Network on several different projects. Um, but, you know, my kind of my joy is working with this group. Um, they're, I'm honored to know them. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight. Uh, the people who presented these webinars have worked tirelessly to give you this information. It's vital information that we all must consider if we're to emerge from these crises. And yeah, we're, <laughs> unless you're living under a rock, you know there's several of them. Um, and we even have to face, you know, the people who are dying so this is happening. Um, this evening I give thanks to Creator, as I always do, and the spirits for touching your hearts and your minds, for your curiosity and whatever reason you decided to join us this evening. I ask that you give thanks in your own way, in your own words, in a time when you feel closest to the great mystery. I ask that in your prayers, you honor your traditions, your ancestors, your family, friends. Give thanks for all that comes to you from whatever source. Give thanks for the sun that brings the light and the heat, the moon for the tides and the lights our way at night. Give thanks for the tiniest of light, life to the tallest trees, the winds that scatter the seeds, the birds that give us their songs, just everything we see and hear and feel, because you're part of it too. What will be, will be again. And through this knowledge, our prayers and our songs, we are of one mind, the good mind. Tonight, as in previous webinars, I'm asked to provide a land acknowledgement. It's basically a reminder to everyone in attendance that the lands we now live were once homes of other people communities, clans, tribes, nations that thrived and learned to live in harmony in these areas, to adapt to their surroundings. But most importantly, they knew without question that their survival depended on adhering to natural law and to recognize that every living entity, everything, everything we see, everything came before and that will be again, has original instructions. Those original instructions are the mystery of life from birth to death, right? The truth is unmistakably illustrated by simply looking at a, a tiny seed. How many people garden here? I'm thinking there's probably a lot that, that grows something, right? So you look at this tiny, tiny little seed and out of that tiny little seed grows these magnificent plants. I think of broccoli because I'm always amazed how tiny those seeds are and they always plant too many, right? And I have to send them out. But I mean, it's, it's amazing. And our ancestors taught us to give thanks for these mysteries. Um, the gifts of creator for all that, and it's freely given to us, right? And all we have to do is respect and care for it. And most, most of all, just not take it for granted. Don't exploit or waste or disrespect in any way. Yet here we are, we're talking about the unbelievable damage that has taken place from centuries of disrespect, exploitation of the gifts from the greed and hubris that somehow we've allowed into our lives. The way it was and still is with many of our peoples, the indigenous peoples, our teachings from our elders passed down from generation after generation, we attempt to share our worldview, remind us that life is centered on our relationship to all life each element playing a necessary part of sustaining life. Our languages, I'm trying to learn mine, conveyed a deep understanding, but more conveyed feelings. They're illustrative. They're so much more um, 
just there's just so much more to our language than there are to English. But it's a feeling of gratitude, of awe and reverence and, and just joy. So in some of our languages, we have two names. We have a common name and then we have a prayer or sacred name. And it's like my aunties taught me that everything in life has two reasons. One is practical and the other is spiritual. So the same thing with our languages. So when we have those names and we have those prayer names, I'm trying to explain it so that y'all can understand it the way I explain it. Anyway, when we have those names, it's, it's making co connection. It's like, it's like recognizing that, that, that there's a language between us, that we're equals. Or maybe we're not equals, maybe they're better than we are, right? So it's actually refer referring to these things as our relatives. And it's a different way of understanding the world, but it's how our peoples lived and thrived. So today, and as I was looking up some stuff today, trying to prepare for tonight, because I'm never really prepared, um, I read this, that there's only 25% of the, the Earth's biodiversity left. That means that we've destroyed three times as much that's, as left, right? And, and in that article, I read that indigenous people, which I didn't know, actually control 82% of that 25%. So today, a lot of people are looking to indigenous people, to our elders, to the stories, to the language, to the knowledge that we have for how to rebuild, how to regenerate, how to avoid some of this damage to begin with, right? And it's true if you relate to or look to our world creation with an indigenous lens, there is a different perspective, right? It's, and, and we're trying to get this perspective into how we look at these environmental assessments, how we can play a part in making these decisions. But one of the things that complicates these assessments of resource projects is this historical skeptic skepticism of our knowledge as well. It's a colonial way of thinking that Western science is the only right way. And that, but even Western science is rejected when it gets in the way of profits and continuous economic growth. So when developers and industry representatives come to us because they're required by law or, you know, it's this consultation project, free prior and informed consent, it, they're just giving lip service to, that's my grandmother used to say. Basically, they're not walking their talk and they were just there, right? And when we reject and oppose the continued destruction, unless we all come together to re reject fossil fuels, you, me, everyone, it doesn't matter what our ancestry is, but we need to also look at ourselves. We need to look at our own consumption because we can't keep, excuse me, demanding more and more from our environment. We need to question how we buy and discard and replace and consume and abandon. You know, we just, it's just like, it's part of our life. We don't even think about it anymore. So we know there's consequences, but we're doing it like there isn't. So tonight, in previous web and like in previous webinars, we're asking for everyone here to question. Question the system of extraction and consumption and planned obsolescence and single use. And so that we can come to terms with reality that there's no such thing as unlimited anything. I mean, the water resources are infinite, that everything we do has consequences. We know that we must come together to find and implement real solutions. And I have trust in the people that I work with. And I have trust in the people who are here tonight, the ones that have brought all this to you. So we know that, you know, Band-Aid methods aren't gonna work. And we can't continue to pretend that adding carbon here and offsetting it here, carbon isn't a zero sum game. We need to come to real solutions that are right for our communities. And we've got to look at single use. We know that we need actionable solutions that won't doom us to, to the dark ages. We're not asking for that. We're not wearing sackcloth and ashes, or as my husband says, we're, <laughs> we're modern Indians. We like our indoor plumbing. You know, there's a way to live, right? That we're not going to destroy everything. But 
we can build local networks, we can teach people how to grow their own food and build and come together as a community to make choices that do the least amount of harm, but also give back to Mother Earth some of what she gives to us. So I know you're going to learn a lot tonight. I am very grateful for the two people who have agreed to come here and give their time and share their knowledge. So thank you everyone, be well. And back to Ryan. Thanks, BJ. Uh, before I introduce the, the first speaker, I would just like to say a few things. Um, my name is Dr. Randy Pokladnik, and my PhD is in environmental studies, and I have a background in chemistry. And all of my extended family lives along the Ohio River on both sides, on, on uh, the Ohio side and on the West Virginia side. So these topics that we're talking about are really pertinent, and I'm worried about what's going to happen to the Ohio River. And as I said, I got to hear Justin talk uh, in Belmont County this, this past winter, and uh, he's talked a lot about the, the radioactivity, and Ohio is just a hotbed for injection wells and using brine to spread on the roads. And then I've, I've never heard Wilma talk, but I know she's involved quite heavily with the petrochemical industry and fighting that in her region. And this is what we don't want. When we talk about stopping the petrochemical region, we always refer to Cancer Alley because we don't want that to be our future. And I live in Harrison County, Ohio, which is, you know, right in the middle of all the infrastructure. So I, I just, you know, like to, you know, thank these two people for, for working so hard and Wilma for doing it so many years and, and Justin for writing about it because it's really hard sometimes to speak truth to power. We know how much power the petrochemical industry has. We've seen it. Um, you know, I've been threatened by them. I've had nasty letters written about me in some of their newspapers, uh, but I guess that means we're striking through with them and and they get it, we're not gonna go away. I'm a volunteer with the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition and I work with um, Bev Reed with the Concerned Ohio River residents that are trying to stop the PTPG cracker plant. So the first speaker we have up is Wilma Supra. Uh, with over 48 years of experience in the field, Wilma Supra's current work is focused on the environmental impacts of various aspects of shale development, the human health impacts associated with various specific units and activities of shale development, the development of appropriate parameters for monitoring groundwater and surface water resources to detect impacts of shale development and the development of guidelines for the regulation of state programs dealing with shale development. And people in the Ohio Valley um, will tell you it's extremely important to know about the health effects of these chemical compounds. We don't really have a great system for monitoring the Ohio River we have the Orsenko Organic uh, Pollution Detection System, but right now we know for a fact that they don't really address plasticizers and some of the petrochemicals. So we're hoping that um, you know Wilma can enlighten us on some of these aspects, and then we can use that information to go after some strict monitoring of the Ohio River. So without further ado, Wilma, you're up. Thank you. Could you put it back on the first slide, please? In the 1970s, natural gas prices were elevated. Electric generation facilities were dependent on that high price of natural gas. And so they started planning how they could get off of natural gas and they converted to nuclear, coal, and lignite. In 1988, EPA reported that mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants were the largest remaining anthropogenic source of mercury being released into the air in the United States. And as it turns out, the coal from Kentucky contained high concentrations of mercury, but the coal from Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming was low in mercury. So actually in Louisiana, we bought trains with the train cars and we went out to Powder River Basin and brought back their coal to fire the coal powers Fireplace. So now natural gas is cheap and plentiful and results in hydrofracking of the shale gas. So cheap natural gas from the Marcellus and the Utica shale is attracting industrial focus into your area along the Ohio River Basin. Now two things have recently happened. The Attorney General and Grand Jury report about the state agency not doing the appropriate things 
as they should be to regulate the shale development and the industries that are performing the shale development. And the grand jury made a lot of recommendations. The two that I want to point out that everyone needs to focus on as quickly as possible is setback. And the grand jury recommended an increase in setback of the well itself from 500 feet to 2,500 feet for homes and businesses, and then a larger setback from schools and hospitals. And that needs to be done right away because we're getting ready to go into a big expansion of industrial facilities in your area. And in order to feed those industrial facilities, you have to keep drilling new wells and putting new wells online because the minute you put them on, their production rate decreases. So that's critical to get all the new wells with the appropriate setback. And then the other issue is that we need to know all the chemicals that are in the frac fluids and being used at those wells. So if we could focus on that right away, it would help, help the community know what's going on and get the wells closer to not being up against. And I feel like I'm back in 2008 and 2010 where a lot of people were trying to do no fracking, fracking bans in their community. And then they came down to doing setbacks instead. And as a result, they had the well set back. But what happened is the well would be set back and then all the associated equipment would be right up against the houses and the hospitals and the schools. So if you can make it also the well and all the equipment has to be 2,500 feet from the houses and the businesses. That would really help as opposed to just having the well and then all the equipment's right up against you. So then the other thing is that there's the bill that was supposed to be signed by the governor is attracting industry to come in. It's a 667 million tax credit and it's requiring the companies to use dry natural gas that's produced in Pennsylvania in the Marcellus and to the lesser amount in the others. So what happens is you're gonna have all these people coming in with all this trying to do new things. And they are talking about 2025 to 2050. I'm not gonna to live to see that, but four facilities a year will each get 6.7 million in um, tax breaks. And what's gonna happen is that over the 25 years, that's gonna be a hundred industrial facilities. So you're gonna be the new cancer alley in the United States. And so it's very critical that you know what's coming your way. So I wanna tell you what's gonna be happening. On the last part of this slide, you see the foreign countries that are coming into Louisiana and trying to develop their resources. You see China, Japan, Taiwan. And so all of those companies are gonna to wanna to come to the Ohio River Valley, take advantage of the tax breaks and your cheap natural gas. It's perfect to set up everything going on in your area. Next slide, please. So natural gas is made up of a number of things. Methane, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 90%. And then ethane, propane, butane, and pentane are up to 20%. So if you look at ethane, propane, and butane, those fractions are separated out from the natural gas stream and used by industry. And what's left of the methane is still usable for a heat source. So you never know whether your natural gas has everything originally in it or it's missing the ethane propane. So when you look at the shell ethane cracker that's going in in your area, they're gonna do ethane to ethylene and make low and high density polyethylene. And then the shell ethane cracker will also convert the ethylene into ethylene oxide and glycol and the different alcohols. And ethylene oxide has been a focus for a lot of um, facilities that use it to disinfect. And we were just getting those facilities shut down because they were releasing it to the air. And then the virus came along and they needed it to take all the bacteria out of all the medical equipment that was going on 
to take care of other people. So next slide, please. So these are the health impacts of the toxic chemicals that are released by the shell ethane cracker. And I want to put the word out, cumulative risk. So as I talk about each chemical and what its health impacts are, you're never exposed to just one chemical, you're exposed to a whole bunch. So you have to consider the cumulative risk. So here you see benzene, it's a carcinogen, you see butadiene. Next, please. I can't see the bottom of the slide, so go ahead. And go to the next slide. And then you see formaldehyde, a known human cancer causing agent, hexane. And you see all the health impacts that will be associated with the chemicals that are going to be coming out of the shell ethane cracker. Next, please. So then we have this facility called Formosa Plastics, which has this permit, is starting to construct. And one of the members that will speak next has a Rise St. James t-shirt on, and they are the group that's fighting it. And I've been participating in the technical issues during the comment period and during the permitting process. But this facility has 14 units. So those 14 units could be individual companies or it could be a combination. And they made it a combination. And they're going to use ethane and propane fractions of the natural gas to make ethylene and propylene. And from the ethylene and propylene, they're going to use it to make high density polyethylene, which is number two, like on the bottom of your bottles. They're going to make low density polyethylene number four. They're going to make propylene, ethylene glycol, propylene is number five. Next, please. And then these are the toxic chemicals that are going to be released into the air by those 14 industrial facilities. And you see a lot of the same ones over again. And again, cumulative impacts. It's not going to be just one chemical. It's going to be all of these chemicals having an impact on your health. Next, please. So these are the acute, the short term, the things that make you sick when you walk outside and you smell something. These are the health impacts that are the acute health impacts of those chemicals. Irritation to the skin, eyes, nose, causing coughing, wheezing. And you see all of those. Can we go to the next one, please? And then these are the chronic health impacts, the long-term impacts that all of the people that live in the area will have over a number of years. Known human cancer causing teratogen, causes nasopharynx cancer, causes all kinds of cancers, affects the liver and the kidneys. Next, please. And then we have vinyl chloride. Now, vinyl chloride is unique and horrible. This is one of the worst ones to have a facility and have to live next to it. The ethylene from natural gas or oil plus chlorine are used to manufacture ethylene dichloride then it goes to vinyl chloride monomer, and then it goes to polyvinyl chloride. So go back. Ethylene is needed to make with chlorine the ethylene dichloride. You have salt deposits in your area. So salt deposits you can use to make solution mine salt, and that's what you use to make chlorine. So you've got the natural gas, and you've got the chlorine. You've got everything right there they need to make vinyl chloride. Now, what happens at a vinyl chloride facility is they release it off-site, and it has a very, very small concentration of ambient standards. And for miles around the facility, the ambient air has the vinyl chloride monomer in excess of the ambient standards. And besides that, it releases huge quantities of dioxin and furans. And communities around these types of facilities have up to three times the national average of dioxin in their blood and all the associated health impacts from their blood. The dioxin also builds up in aquatic and terrestrial organisms, in the fruit trees in their yard, in the nut trees in their yard. It contaminates the soil and everything is contaminated over acceptable levels and needs to have standards put out that you shouldn't be consuming that. So anywhere there's a vinyl chloride facility, it's going to be disaster for the people. So let's look at the health impacts that are caused by the vinyl chloride chemicals. Next, please. So this is a huge short term. And I can walk outside near one of these facilities and I get every one of these impacts 
immediately. And then next slide will show you the chronic impact. Known human cancer causing agent, causes blood cancer, causes damage, causes spontaneous abortion. And it also causes angiosarcoma of the liver and brain cancer. And whatever is released into the air causes all these health impacts, but the vinyl chloride monomer is angiosarcoma of the liver and brain. And so the workers and the citizens are all going to be impacted by these health impacts. Next, please. Next, please. There we go. So let me tell you about methanol. Louisiana has three methanol facilities along Cancer Alley. It's produced from natural gas and oxygen, and we have lots of cheap natural gas. And then it's used to manufacture plastics, polyesters, fibers, fabrics, pesticides, fuel, pharmaceuticals, and adhesives. Louisiana has these three on Cancer Alley. They are by Chinese companies that are gonna make it in Louisiana because they can't make it in China because of the emissions are so bad. They can use our cheap natural gas, they're gonna ship it to China, make plastics and sell the plastics back to us in the United States. And so what you don't want is allow these methanol facilities. I've been able to work with communities around the country and defeat a number of these methanol facilities. Next slide will show you the acute health impact. And th this will show you there are three of them. The YCI and St. James are both in St. James where the Formosa facility is, where Rise St. James is on his shirt and you'll see his shirt in a minute. These are the capacities. And the issue is that based on capacity is not necessarily the highest emitters. You'll see differences in emissions like based on the capacity. So okay. next slide, please. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, these are the other chemicals, the toxic air pollutants that are being released by these methanol facilities. And you'll see huge quantities a year, and you'll see St. James methanol air emissions with a capacity of 5,275 tons a day, while the YCI facility, also in St. James, has a lower air emission. So even though we worked on all of those during the permitting process and appealed the permits, we still didn't get it evened out to where they were all acceptable emissions the best we could do. Next slide. And these are the acute hemp impacts related to those methanol facilities. And the next one will show you the chronic health impacts. Next one, please. And these show you, once again, carcinogens, teratogens, leukemia, damage the developing fetus, all the things that the community is going to have to deal with over the long haul. Next, please. So these are the chemicals released into the air from compressor stations. Now, in order to get the natural gas from the wells to these industrial facilities that are going to be flowing into your community, you need pipelines. And these are the chemicals that are released into the air from compressor stations that move the natural gas along the pipeline. And as a result, people within two to five miles of these facilities have all of these health impacts, which you'll see on the next one. Next, please. It, those are the acute ones. And then 90% of the individuals living within two to three miles have all of these health impacts, as well as the next ones that will show you the chronic health impacts. Next, please. There you go. And now we have to talk about biomonitoring. What we need is biomonitoring in place before these facilities come in, and then we can do a baseline and then figure it out as they start operating, how it's bioaccumulating. So we've done these in, related to natural gas, where we take samples at the production site, where we put monitors on the individuals who either work there or are citizens, and then we take samples in their houses, and we've been able to document the health impacts associated with the chemicals. We take urine samples and have urine tested for the chemicals and their metabolites. And then we are able to say the health impacts that people are having is associated with the chemicals they're discharging in their urine. And so urine is a lot easier to get than blood. It's not as invasive. 
and it's critical to finding out what people are being exposed to and what health impacts they are potentially having and how much they're excreting from their bodies. Next, please. So cause and effect. The virus has demonstrated what we've been saying all along. These people are exposed to all these chemicals from all these industrial facilities and that has a negative effect on their body and makes them more vulnerable to having the virus and being killed by the virus. So we have 70,000 cases statewide. We've had over 3,000 people die. We, right now we have over 1,000 people in the hospitals and uh, over 100 on the ventilators. St. John the Baptist Parish is in Cancer Alley. It has the DuPont Dinka facility that makes fluoroprene and neoprene. It has refinery and it also has a facility releasing ethylene oxide. And it is the largest at risk parish in the state of Louisiana. And as of April the 7th, they we were number one in the whole United States based on per capita deaths. And as it turned out, next slide, you'll see what happens is that these, all the parishes on Cancer Alley are ranking in the top 20 in the whole United States. Next slide, please. Pre-existing conditions also cause the death of these people. These are the primary symptoms and then the recovery depends on their strength. On the next one, you'll see the existing conditions that cause hypertension. And all of these are associated with the chemicals I just showed you from all those industrial facilities. And only 5% of the deaths did not have pre-existing conditions. So as a result of their historical exposure, and the same thing is going to go on in your area. And when you have a pandemic like this, those are the people that are going to get the disease and die the quickest. Next, please. Next, here we go. Okay, so these are the rates. And we have a 30% African American population in Louisiana, and yet more than 70% of the deaths are African American. And they, for the most part, are poor. They live close to the industrial facilities and are being exposed more than the white population. And so you see, this is what's going to happen down the line in your area. Next, please. So these are three studies that Earthworks, I'm chairman of the board of Earthworks, and we do studies through Oil and Gas Accountability Project. And these three are about what's going on in Pennsylvania, gas patch roulette, blackout, and the gas patch just shows what the Pennsylvania Environmental Agency was not doing and not telling the people. And then the investigation link between shale gas and health. This one's published in New Solutions. And we had a meeting in DC when we were just starting this and there were a lot of people from all the universities and say, we really want to do the health impacts, but we don't know how to do it. And we don't know how to get money. And we had already gone out and done it and we were getting ready to publish the data. So it's important to have people that you can depend on to get out and get the work done and solve the problems right away and identify the problems and help the communities understand what those problems are. Next, please. Thank you. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat for uh, Wilma, which this was really great. I know earlier today we had something, uh, earlier we had something on why don't we have taxes on plastics. So we have, um, let's see. Wilma, can you, can you address that or? Many years ago, 
we had a governor elected, Governor Romer, and he put together a transition team. And we were trying to come up with what needed to be done from the environment and human health issues. And one of the guys insisted on having a bottle bill and that it would cost so much for the bottle and you'd get the deposit back. And industry fought it, fought it, fought it. And the next session, I said, okay, let's put together all the people that are part of the problem and part of the solution and see what we can do to start recycling. And when the bill passed and the governor signed it, all the industry guys were up there getting their pen and standing there getting their picture. And I'm standing against the back wall and managed to keep all these people working together. But one of the things is if you start trying to do a tax on plastic, just like a bottle bill, everybody in the world is going to fight it. But it's worth trying. It's worth associating so that you can make the best situation possible. So I would encourage you to try it. Okay. Do, are there any agencies that are in line to approve these plastic plants right now? Oh, the environmental agencies in the state and most states in the big industry, it's delegated from EPA to the state agency. So it's a decision made by the state agency. And like I said, y'all have this tax incentive so the state agencies are be encouraged to give them their permit. Okay. Um, let's see. A lot of people are saying thank you. It's an excellent presentation, but frightening too. Um, I'm sorry. I'm they, sorry. They, they, they said it's great. reality. And like I said, I'm not going to live to see it, but y'all are going to have to live through it because with this tax incentive, they're going to be lining up to come and build their facilities with your cheap natural gas and with your salt to give them brine, to give them chlorine. Yes, that's not a good situation. Okay, um, Randy, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Wilma. I did have one question for you before we move on to the next speaker. Are these corporations, are these companies required to submit products of release inventories annually? She was really breaking up. Can someone repeat that, please? Are these are these agencies required to submit toxic release inventories? I'm sorry, I cannot understand you at all. You're really breaking up. So Wilma, the question was, are these industries um, required to release something toxic re toxic release inventories, maybe? Yes. Sure, the, sure. The TRI, they will have to report. But remember, that permit will allow them to release these chemicals into the air and they will go off site. So even though they're reporting under TRI and you'll have access to that data, you can also look on their the uh, website with the environmental agency and see what their annual reports are as well as TRI. But yeah, they will be required to report to TRI. Thank you. I'm hoping you can hear me. Can anybody hear me? We can hear you, but it might be easier if you had a headset on for that, but go ahead. Okay, so I'm ready to introduce Justin. And Before you do, could I ask a question of Wilma? Sure. Uh, Wilma, one thing I've wondered about is um, I've, I've heard it alleged that the uh, toxic release inventory reports uh, for a given facility by EPA are not always accurate, one, and that the sampling sometimes intentionally misses periods of high release. Is that, does that happen or is that a, a rare or impossible event? And I've worked on TRI since the beginning and served on a number of advisory committees. They, they, the numbers they put out are based on some calculations and some actual data. But when you start looking at those numbers and you look at what their permits allow and what they're reporting to the agency as their permit report, they don't match. 
And people look at the TRI because it's easy to get to, and they don't look at what's being reported to the agency. And frequently, I'll go into the agency and say, look, this is what they're saying here, and this is what they're saying there, and they don't match. And then the agency starts evaluating it. But it's self-reported, so you have to say, are they reporting it correctly? Because it's self-reported. Like the fox watching the hen house. Okay, uh, so let's move on uh, to Justin. Justin Noble writes on issues of science and the environment for Rolling Stone, Audubon, Oxford American, Vsmog, and other U.S. magazines. Investigative sites and literature. Presently, working up about the issue of the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas production and the many different pathways of contamination posed to the industry's workers, the public and communities, and the environment to be published with Simon and & Schuster and tentatively titled Petroleum 238, Big Oil's Dangerous Secret and the Grassroots Fight to Stop It. And I can say that we live three miles away from it's called the Denison Depot, and it is an injection site. They just added a third well to that site, and it's just across the street from a row of houses. And I drive by it every time I have to go to the grocery store, and our highway is constantly. Okay, Justin, you're muted. All right, some quick. Hopefully Randy will make it back in, but uh, thank you, Randy, for the introduction. And Justin, welcome. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending this. Um, it's a really, really exciting group to give this talk to. Um, thank you to Wilma. Really, Wilma is, um, she's a wonderful expert. She's a wonderful human being. She's someone I've spoken to for many different stories and learned a lot from and it's uh, it's really an honor to present with her and to do what she does so well which is put information back to you all back to people in communities who are charged and energized to use it um it's you know it's an ancient process and uh, even though we're on zoom I think we're engaging in it well. Um, and I just want to show this shirt because Wilma had mentioned this. So this is a very cool shirt. The bottom is people marching and it was an amazing march. And there's actually, I don't know if you can see, but there's people in wheelchairs, there's people, um, I mean, people are sick, so people are impaired, um, but just all sorts of people came out um, and have can come out time and again um, in St. James, um, you know, energized and educated by Wilma and others. And, uh, and there's many people involved in that fight. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's great to make and continue these connections between Louisiana and Ohio. Um, so I will um, go back up to my face. So yeah, this is a topic I, I write on issues of the environment and science for a number of different magazines and investigative sites. I lived in Louisiana for five years and covered the petrochemical industry, and I now live up in the Northeast. And for the past three years, I've been here, and my focus a bit has been the Marcellus and the Utica um, shale development, fracking. And the, within that, this really potent topic emerged, uh, a really so powerful as, um, as to really be missed by a lot of folks, and that is radioactivity. Um, and I'll just lay out the research question that I began this investigation with. Um, it's let's examine the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas development and the many different pathways of contamination posed to the industry's workers, the public and communities, uh, and the environment. Um, and tonight I'm going to focus on a really specific aspect of that. So if you read the article that came out earlier this year in Rolling Stone that I did, I talk a lot about uh, issues at the wellhead. I talk a lot about brine. You see a brine truck right there. That's the cover of the Rolling Stone article. Um, and, and it's important to mention this brine truck is unloading brine, which is a toxic material, at an injection well that's um, literally on the edge of a shopping mall. 
Um, you can sit in Taco Bell and watch uh, trucks like that, as I've done on a number of occasions, uh, unload. Um, but th that sort of regulatory um, inattention, regulatory abyss, um, you know, I'm now going to take it to the other side of the oil and gas chain, which is downstream. Um, so we're going to look at pipelines, compressor stations, and cracker plants. Um, and I just want to start also another really great expert, uh, Dr. Marco Keltepin, a nuclear forensic scientist, and he just lays this out so well. You know, we all have an idea of what oil and gas development is, um, but it's, it's also this. Essentially what you are doing is taking an underground radioactive reservoir and bringing it up to the biosphere where it can interact with people and the environment. Um, so, you know, we think of oil and gas, we think of um, all the issues that, that Wilma described, uh, other issues we know connected to climate, um, but we've also essentially made an underground transit system for bringing radioactivity to the surface. Um, and even though it's something I really didn't know about um, and something a lot of folks um, really have not been informed on, there actually is a lot of information on. And I'm gonna to get to that, but first also wanted to place it here in the Appalachia area. I know many of you probably are familiar with this report that the Department of Energy just came out with, but uh, they've been using this language for a couple of years now, a renaissance. A renaissance is underway in Appalachia. Um, and when I look through these reports and I do so in detail, there is, um, I mean, there's hardly even mention at all uh, about environmental issues, but there's no mention of these radioactivity issues that I'm about to lay out. And yet these same departments, the DOE and various government agencies know full well that there are uh, major risks. So um, just a, a quick slide that I crafted myself and I always like to start with, because it actually conveys a lot of information. So we're talking about um, oil and gas waste, which is another revelation. There isn't just oil and gas that's brought to the surface at an oil and gas well. There's a variety of forms of waste, and many of them can be quite radioactive. Um, we have brine, we have drill cuttings. I've spoke about, spoken about these things in other talks. Um, I'm going to focus now on number four, the product itself, so natural gas and natural gas liquids. Um, and while radium is typically, at least initially, the radioactive element of concern in brine um, with natural gas and natural gas liquids, and natural gas liquids, again, are, are many of the things that Wilma mentioned, ethane, propane, um, the concern there, the radioactive element, at least initially of concern, is radon. Um, and get into that, but first, um, he, here, these are just the questions we're gonna try and answer. Um, and, and the main question is, do we have enough evidence supplied by the industry itself, the industry's own documents to confirm that these contamination risks are real, that they should be examined? Um, so we're gonna talk about the infrastructure chain um, and, and really the entire supply chain uh, has specific radioactive contamination risks associated with it. The risks to workers, they're legitimate, um, but they're ignored. Then two, uh, there are many places along the downstream chain where radioactive risks are posed to the public. These risks are poorly studied. And then lastly, um, these plants, whether it's a cracker plant, a compressor station, components of a pipeline system, uh, they will end up with an incredible amount of radioactive material and the industry still has not solved. Uh, and in recent times, really, I haven't seen any attention at all given as to how they're gonna deal with that material. Um, so, um, so we're going to start and we're going to stick as much as we can to the industry's own words on this. Um, and this is a, a, a time, you know, it's interesting to mention, well, why did the industry come out? And if you see in the corner, June 25th, 1990, what happened in 1990? And, and Wilma actually mentioned it. Uh, Louisiana had this um, rare governor, right, who actually, Buddy Romer, was... Um, and what I know from Wilma and others gave you all a voice and actually to ask the environmentalists, you know, what, what's happening in the state? What are the problems? What should we focus on? And one of the issues was oil and gas radioactivity. And at that time, there was a secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality, so the equivalent in Pennsylvania, for example, of the DEP, um, who actually cared about these issues. He had a PhD, uh, he had worked in the industry, but also worked a lot with environmental groups his name was Paul Temple, uh, and so he was able to put out standards on norm. They were the first in the country, and so what happened in the early 90s is you had this awakening where the industry 
had to do a self-analysis. They had to think about how much radioactive material they were producing because suddenly you had a state that was digging into it uh, regulation-wise. Um, so in that moment of self-analysis, we get a lot of powerful papers, and this is one of them. And again, the Oil and Gas Journal, you don't get more official than that. And just some quote, um, so after that, so the same author, after publishing in the Oil and Gas Journal, three years later, they published in an even more prominent spot, which is the Society of Petroleum Engineers Journal of Petroleum Technology. And so I'm gonna read their quotes from that paper. Uh, right at the beginning, they say, contamination of oil and gas facilities with naturally occurring radioactive materials, um, they refer to that as norm, is widespread. Norm contamination can be expected at nearly every petroleum facility. Uh, immediately, a question is answered with the second point. Some contamination may be sufficiently severe that maintenance and other personnel may be exposed to hazardous concentrations. These long-lived radioactive materials present a growing problem to the industry. Um, and then talking about this issue, radium often at the production facilities, but downstream it's radon and radon decay products. So already we're beyond where the regulators are right now, which is that they seem to think this isn't an issue at all. Um, another really prominent early paper, uh, we go again to the, um, the source here, that American Petroleum Institute, who even knew they had a department of medicine and biology, um, but they did, and they came out with this paper in uh, 1982, an analysis of the impact of the regulation of radionuclides as a hazardous air pollutant on the petroleum industry. And again, they are scientists, uh, and they laid it out um, quite um, uh, pointedly in this paper. Almost all materials of interest and use to the petroleum industry contain measurable quantities of radionuclides that reside finally in processing equipment, product streams, or waste. Uh, and then going down to what we're going to be focused on, radon-222 and its daughters cause the most severe impact to the public health, um, and it could pose a severe burden on the company's regulation could, um, you think? Um, but they clearly, you know, that's 82. They've had a long time to form a game plan on this. Um, so I, again, little drawing. Um, apologize the crude drawing skills, but a lot can be conveyed with this little drawing. So we're looking at really the oil and gas supply chain. So on the left, we have a wellhead. We go through a pipeline system to a compressor station. Remember, natural gas is a gas. It expands. So inherently, you have to compress it. You have to keep it compact to keep it pushed through a pipeline system. We have a natural gas processing plant, number three, where we'll take out the natural gas liquids. We'll separate the ethane, the propane, and then go on to some of the other facilities that Wilma mentioned, such as number four, an ethane cracker plant. Um, and eventually uh, we get to natural gas fired power plants or we get to the home stoves. I'm gonna focus on the upper part here, uh, but certainly you know, we can ask questions later if you have them on the latter things. Um, but the point is this entire chain, various components will accumulate radioactivity. Um, and I'll run through the science because it's actually not that difficult. So radon is a gas. It's a radioactive gas. And it does what any radioactive element does, which is at some point it will decay, which just means it will blast off its uh, like little pieces of itself. And that's literally what we call radiation. So radon decays, it blasts off little pieces of itself, and then it has actually become another element. Um, and the first element that radon becomes is a form of polonium. And radon has a swift decay life. It has a swift um, half-life. So in about 3.8 days, on average, half of your radon will have decayed, and it will become this form of polonium. And so polonium is a solid. So radon is a gas. It's flowing fine through the pipeline system. Over time, it's decaying. And remember, all radon molecules are going to decay at a different rate. And as it decays, blast off radiation, but if it's in the pipeline system, that's not necessarily harming any humans, but now it's become a solid radioactive element and it's not flowing so easily. So it will get caught up. It will get stuck on various components of the pipeline system. It will get caught up on filters, pumps, and valves. Um, and just think of, um, go back to this for a second for this analogy, just think of your kitchen sink, where gunk gets caught up. It gets caught up in places where there's changes in temperature, changes in pressure, changes in flow patterns. So it's gonna be a similar thing in the natural gas, pro, um, in the natural gas and, and NGL system. Um, this is just uh, for added measure. So natural gas has always had a 
a, a radioactivity um, issue. It's always been there. And in just a moment, I'll show you a really fascinating EPA paper from 1973 that gets into that. Um, but we now, in the Marcellus, we're dealing with an even greater issue. Both the Utica and the Marcellus are black shales. Um, these are specific layers that the USGS looked at many years ago and determined have an exceptionally high radioactivity content. So we're not just dealing with a conventional layer, which is um, typically oil and gas that has escaped from the black shell. The black shell is really like the mother load of the oil and gas. And in a conventional layer, just go back to our first um, slide here because it explains that. So conventional layer is just the escaped oil and gas that's come up out of the black shell in some way, gone through the ground, and it collects in a truck and it's easy to access, right? We stick a pipe in it and it spurts out West Texas oil style. Um, but the black shale, the oil and gas is still stuck tight in there. So we have to frack it uh, and we have to do this complex process. And this is what the USGS is telling us about black shales, um, that at least the Marcellus and the Utica, but really all black shales can have a significant radioactivity content. And so the USGS, when they looked at, the Mar um, when they looked at black shales, uh, and these are all in the East, um, fairly positive relation between oil yield and uranium content exists for some of these shales. And then talking about the amount of uranium in these shales is extremely large, reckoned in billions of tons of metallic uranium. So what's important right now and has not necessarily been done is to reckon, we have very few bits of data, and I'm gonna to try to present as many as we do have um, on radioactivity content in natural gas in general. We have some, but we do not have many at all since the age of fracking, since we started cracking into this layer, which we know has an even higher radioactive signature. And that's, that alone is a, is a reason to assess any petrochemical development connected to the Marcellus and Utica uh, with a great deal of scrutiny. Um, so we go back to this excellent 1993 Society of Petroleum Engineers paper. Um, and just to pull some quotes out, what, what are they talking about? Radon contamination in natural gas is a worldwide problem and particularly high concentrations of radon reported in the US and Canada. So it's in all oil fields, but especially bad here. Um, an important second note, because radon contamination in, in natural gas, um, because, ra because of radon contamination, these radioactive films can be found at gas well heads, in transport piping, headers, treater units, pumps, and within natural gas processing plants or other light hydrocarbon facilities. So again, when they say radioactive films, they're talking about radon's decayed, it's become a metal, and this metal in some way has settled out. It can film a scale or it can fill, uh, for, form a film on various equipment. Um, but what we take that to mean is really the entire downstream infrastructure system poses risks. Radioactivity will be highest in these places, pumps, valves, filter, other places where pressure and temp changes. And again, think of the kitchen sink. And I'll just read this uh, third one. Um, only in 1971 that radon was found to concentrate in the lighter natural gas liquids during processing and could present a serious health hazard to industry personnel. So only in 1971, we're now half a century beyond 1971, um, and no worker, no worker that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to dozens, uh, is aware of that line. So um, that information, unfortunately, has been around for a long time, but has not gotten out. Um, so we're still in the same paper. Uh, how radioactive is the equipment? Oftentimes, and it's a, a big criticism I'll get, uh, comparing radioactivity in oil and gas to a banana to other things. Well, no, we actually know from your own papers <laughs> that it's uh, significant. So during processing in a gasoline plant, um, so referring, I believe, to like a refinery there. Um, and, and remember, natural gas liquids, you know, gasoline um, is just part of that chain, it's gonna be sent to a refinery. And all these plants are, they're just, you look at a cracker plant, it's a lot of tubes and pipes. So you're just running product at different temperature, at different pressures and settling or not settling, expanding things out. So, um, and, and various pumps and valves are gonna take care of that. And again, that's where the contamination is. So in this paper, they look at a liquids pump in a gasoline plant or refinery um, and they determined that radioactivity could be as high as 25 milliroontgens uh, an hour. What does that mean? Well, go to the EPA's website, 0.00445 um, is about background, milliroontgens an hour. So we're talking more than 5,000 times background, and we know um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
has a limit for the public. Remember, oil and gas workers are not considered radiation workers, so their limit would be the public limit, um, which is um, 100 millirems a year. He, in this case, um, millirem and millirentian would be about the same. Um, so 100, that means if a worker stands by that pump for four and a half hours, uh, they've exceeded their yearly uh, limit. Um, so we're, we're far beyond, you know, just the radioactivity is all around us. No, this is a serious risk. And again, our workers are aware of this. Uh, I'm in the process of finding out just how aware, but I haven't seen um, much evidence to show they are. I want to just point you all to table three, because again, industry's own words, they're saying priority areas of concern for high radon and radon decay product contamination. And they list um, different units, um, even truck terminals, for example, any place where you have a settling out, where you have a, a change, where you have a sitting of material, um, pig receivers, another big one, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, okay, so what about an ethane cracker? I know that, you know, some of the, the biggest um, fights are against the ethane crackers. They're a massive facility, as Wilma laid out. There are so many reasons to uh, be alarmed by their presence uh, or their proposed presence in your community. Um, now, there actually is not any data that I could find from the United States talking specifically about radioactivity buildup um, at an ethane cracker. But there is a study from Argentina um, and some quotes from it. They And here, upper right, you'll see the, um, the banner of it if you want to look it up yourself. It's, um, I believe this study is easily available, but if not, drop me a line. Um, these two facilities, so they're, they're breaking a number of different oil and gas facilities up. They make a list. F and G are facilities that produce ethylene and polyethylene. So that's what an ethane cracker does. Um, it cracks ethane into ethylene. So we're talking about an ethane cracker. And again, they, they you know, tested some of the equipment. They tested the pump. Now we're dealing in a different unit, the unit that Europe and much of the rest of the world deals with, micro sieverts. Um, and this paper actually gives the background, which is 0.15, and then gives the level that they found at that pump, which is 400. So we do a simple division calculation. Uh, the pump is 2,667 times the background. Now, what, uh, so what a regulator who wants to defend this industry will say, and has said to me, well, no worker is going to stand next to that pump all day. And I'll say, well, well, how, really? <laughs> you know what they're all doing? Are, are there any signs uh, at the pump? Do the workers even know to be concerned about the pump? Do the workers even know, especially to be concerned about instances in the workday um, when they have to access the pump, open it up, which would make uh, create a pathway for even more exposure? And that's what this next slide uh, describes. This is coming from a 2016 report of the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. So again, we're we're at the top of the oil and gas scientific food chain here. Um, and, and, and this diagram is actually incredibly scientifically accurate uh, and frightening. It shows what happens. Here's your oil and gas worker in a situation um, where they're outside the pump, they'd still be getting gamma radiation. Um, once the pump is opened up, alpha particles and beta particles, they cannot go as far, um, but if you, open them up if you've created a way such as radon, which is a gas which can easily be inhaled, such as uh, various daughter products of radon that can attach to particles in the air, essentially dust, and you can breathe it in. You've now created a way to breathe in these particles. And whereas your skin can block an alpha particle, the internal organs of your body cannot. And so this diagram lays it out pretty well. You breathe it into your lung, if you've accidentally inhaled it, or you breathed it in to your GI tract if you've accidentally ingested it, um, and it's now going to continue its radioactive decay, blasting out radioactivity inside your body. Um, but again, um, we're still quoting from this 1993 Society of Petroleum Engineers paper. You know, they're laying out a warning, and I just and I every time I, a new worker emerges and and um, speaks to me and shares their story. You know, I run these things by them. Are you aware of this? Have you seen this paper? Um, in a appropriately functioning industry, um, sure, there are risks, but the workers would be aware of the risks and the workers would be informed and know the proper research that talks about the risks. Um, but in all the cases that I've encountered, at least in the Marcellus and Utica, they're, they're unaware and, and furthermore, they're actually intentionally often misinformed. 
um, told that there is no risk. Um, and I'll just settle on this for one more moment because um, this is something uh, that I'll be able to get into more detail when I publish my book, but there's a whistleblower I'm in touch with now who cleans the pumps and valves that come from ethane cracker plants from compressor stations. And every time a worker reaches out, I really learn so much more. And, and it's just you know really important to keep that access to the industry because these people have a lot of information. And what this particular worker conveyed is that the pumps and valves from say a cracker plant, they're not always gonna be clean on site. And again, the pump and valve, that's where the most contaminated material is gonna get caught up, gunked up. Um, so they don't clean them on site. They often, because they're really intricate pieces of equipment, they send them through the US mail to facilities far away from the oil field. And so this worker works at a site um, not so far from Boulder in Colorado. It's located uh, right across the street from a brewery. They're a machinist, so they work in a shop. They get a package in the US mail containing a, a valve or pump from a cracker plant. They've described it to me as like the box is dripping um, open. It's wet with gunk. Um, it's highly radioactive. They were never informed of that. And their job in an office without ventilation is to essentially chisel out that material. It's, it's a really difficult job because it's an intricate piece of equipment. The oil company wants it back in the cracker plant like the next day. They can't break anything. Uh, and they're chiseling out this material, creating a tremendous amount of dust and, and have not been informed by the worker that there is dust and, or sorry, that the dust would have a significant, a potentially significant radioactive signature. And, and why that's so important? Well, it's right next to a brewery. If this facility and others like it had to appropriately acknowledge the materials that they were working with, uh, they in many cases would not be able, they would need different permits and would not be able to be cited in locations like that. So you start to see the ramifications um, of, you know, or at least there's certain incentives to not, um, to not tell the worker, to not put this out in the open. So um, I know a lot of industry reports um, that I'm presenting here, they're powerful, but even more powerful is an actual industry expert. Um, Alan MacArthur, you know, literally helped found this field of oil and gas radioactivity, um, has worked overseas, has worked here with many US companies, and he gave this amazing presentation uh, at a conference last year, um, Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors, um, and he laid out how much, how much radioactivity would be in a natural gas pipeline. Um, so radon, remember, we're compressing the gas, we're compressing the radon. So we've now created a situation where we're going to have more radon. Um, MacArthur talks about radon as high as 12,000 picocuries per liter. Now, EPA's limit on radon in homes is four. So we've uh, created a, a significant amount more radon. Um, and while the pipeline itself isn't necessarily in a home, it's venting in places right next to homes. Um, what is happening there? address that in a moment, but we're also, remember, building up the radon daughters. They're going to get caught in places um, like filters and valves, and MacArthur looked at that. He looked at some of the long-lived radon daughters, which are lead-210, polonium-210. Polonium is one of the most hazardous uh, substances on Earth, um, and MacArthur determined that these elements are accumulating in natural gas filters um, at levels each radionuclide, we list three there, 1.1 million picocuries per gram. To get, add them together, that's 3.3 million picocuries per gram. That's an extraordinary level. So we don't necessarily even have limits, uh, formal limits for some of these elements, but to give you a comparison, radium, another radioactive element, the limit at like a Superfund site or um, uh, old uranium, it would be the limit for if you want to clean it up, how much could you have in the soil is going to be five picocuries per gram. We have polonium 210 building up in natural gas pipelines, according to an industry expert in the filters, at 1.1 million picocuries per gram. Um, so, where does it go? Well, it's going to be cleaned out by someone who's um, doing a pigging operation. Um, but a major question is well, where else might it be going? And these are conclusions from an industry expert. So, um, again, don't say, oh, a Rolling Stone journalist or a DeSmog writer told me this. No, no, no. Say Alan MacArthur, a 36-year industry expert, laid out a presentation where they concluded that there is risk for inhalation ingestion of gas T-norm, that it must be presented, that workers should be wearing respirators. 
and that respiratory air and public air monitoring is required on all gas tenon projects, which would be any of the infrastructure that we're talking about here in Appalachia. Um, and, and again, extraordinary, there it is, the industry saying it, um, and it should be brought back um, to our regulators. Um, I'm just going to skip these slides for now because I know it's a lot of science, but this is just giving some of the details on um, radon and then these darter products lead 210, polonium 210. Um, and I'll quickly go into this because I think this is such an important document. So again, the EPA did look in 1973 at the radon issue and you see the title right there, assessment of potential radiological health effects from radon and natural gas. So my first wow moment is like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this exists. Um, and then you look at it and now just skip to the, some of the conclusions. Um, so they did essentially say, we don't think radon is necessarily a problem, but they also said, and we're talking about home stoves here. They're not necessarily, they're looking at the pipeline and the wellhead concentrations to determine how much would be coming out in home stoves. And while they came up with this uh, conclusion that like it should be all right, um, we don't have all the data in. They, they uh, appropriately admit that they had problems. They don't have data from all regions. Um, now you'd think someone would have followed up on this. This is 1973. This is well before fracking. Um, we're not totally sure of the science in this study. The own, the own authors actually say that. And yet there's been no follow-up. No follow-up. And think of all the ramifications connected to this. Um, <laughs> and no follow-up. Um, and so here we get to a question. And maybe I'll just... Um, I think this is a good place to leave it. We're almost done here anyway, but I want to leave room for questions. Um, and I know it's a lot of info, but, but this is really one of the major research questions, in my opinion. So you follow industry expert Alan MacArthur's science, you follow the science in the Society of Petroleum Engineers paper, and you know you have a lot of radon in the natural gas system. It's going through the pipelines. It's over time decaying out, um, but it's also going to be blasting out. I mean, if you have a release, of the pipeline system and you have 12,000 picocuries per liter radon in the pipeline system, well, it's gonna be coming out. Radon is what we call a noble gas. It's not bonding to anything else. It's shooting, uh, it's not bonding to anything else. It, so we imagine it would be shooting out in flares like this. Um, and so, and I've asked this question to regulators, well, um, how much radon is going out and where is it going? And they'll say, oh, well, it's being vented. So our science, our regulatory action ends there. Well, no, we can go back to the decay chain. We know radon decays to other radioactive elements, which decay to other radioactive elements. We end up with lead 210 and polonium 210. How much is settling out downwind uh, of anywhere along the pipeline, compressor station system where you have a vent or flare? Um, no one's been able to answer that question that I know of because no one has actually asked that question appropriately. And that's one of the things I'm working on now is to get, and I actually recently made contact with a fantastic um, expert in radon and radar daughter products who is interested in doing this science. Um, and um, like Wilma said, um, but they need the funding. So um, that's something I'm trying to put together. But even to get a scientist, you know, ear who has the means of looking at this, um, because this is a really important question. If you can show, and the science, I, I think what it leads us here, you can show that you have radioactivity, even in a minor amount accumulating downwind, um, you suddenly add a new mix of, of, concern, of concerns uh, to these facilities. And this is just a graphic showing, you know, you would have emissions, emissions blowing around in Appalachia. You have, you have high mountains, you have valleys, things settle in valleys. Um, so again, don't let the regulators say, oh, well, the radon, it just floats away. Well, no, radon is a very heavy gas. It settles and you have inversions all the time. Uh, has anyone looked at how much radon daughter products would be settling out in the valleys? These are all appropriate questions. So I, um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there and go to questions. I'm just looking. Justin, we do have a question. Can you sure. elaborate on the oil and gas talking points where they compare to radioactivity of equipment to that of of a banana, I guess. That's okay. What yeah. It does. So this is, um, so I'll go back to this slide. Um, well, actually, this, this is maybe a more appropriate slide to um, center on for this question. So it's a really great question. And it's something that if you're not prepared for, a regulator or an industry um, connected person 
could, could pacify us. And as they try to do me and say, this isn't a problem. So uh, a banana, a lot of cat, uh, potassium, and one isotope, one form of potassium is potassium-40. Um, it's a radioactive isotope of potassium. And its decay, its half-life, um, is on the order of a billion years. So if you eat a banana, you will invariably be eating some radioactive potassium. Now, there's so many molecules of potassium that even though the average molecule would only decay in a billion years, and that's no risk, right? I mean, if it's going to, if you just ate a radioactive molecule and it's going to decay in a billion years, you're fine. If it decays in 100,000 years, you're fine. If it decays in like four days, um, that's a problem. But it turns out that because the, the half-life is so long and also because the way your body processes potassium, there's really not that much um, radioactivity that you're gonna get from a banana. It's not that big of a concern or else I think we all would have stopped eating bananas long ago. And another important note to disassemble the banana um, issue, um, what uh, one of the experts I'm in touch with uh, calls the banana red herring. So another important note is banana, um, so the potassium 40 will decay, it will give off a beta particle and it will become either argon or calcium. Calcium is a good thing for your body and most of the potassium 40 that decays will actually become calcium. Argon is not necessarily as harmful uh, as other things. So it decays once every billion years and it gives off two things and then it's done, it's stable. Now we're gonna go to the oil and gas, some of the radioactive elements in the oil and gas chain. And here we are in the middle at radon. Above radon, we have radium, which is again, the issue at the wellhead. But, uh, at the wellhead. but even with radon, you see there is a long decay chain. And these radioactive elements are not for one, they're not decaying uh, on a scale of billions of years. Radon decays on average 3.8 days. Um, the next element in the chain, uh, uh, isotope of polonium, 3.1 minutes. And if you look at these other elements, they decay really, really quickly. So if you swallow radon, you've got a bunch of quick decays. Uh, they're going to happen in your lifetime. They're going to probably happen in a couple minutes. Um, and you're going to end up with a number of these decays are alpha decays. So you're getting much more dangerous type of radioactivity than the banana, which is beta. So sorry to make that long, but it's really important. And once you get that, um, you know, you have a lot of knowledge. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to know where the brewery is and what beer they have. My husband loves to drink beer. You know, I, I just, um, I would have to look at my notes to see what brewery, and when I finally write that out, I'm gonna label, uh, I'm gonna, you know, describe it in detail, but that's just part of the story I'm still writing. But I okay, feel it's important. But, but you yeah. need to privately let me know about that because <laughs> I wanna make sure he doesn't buy that beer anymore. <laughs> okay, yeah. we do have another, uh, another question. Is there any radioactivity signature or effects that can be related to the deep water horizon exposure, explosion and oil spill? And I would, you know, put that towards both of both you or Wilma. Yeah, well, I don't really, I haven't looked, you know, studied that issue so well, if that's something you can talk to. We, we had the signature of the crude that was coming out. We never did have the radioactivity and we had some samples originally and they went through legal channels and had all of those samples taken from us. So we never had an opportunity to do all that analysis and, and have a, a complete analysis. They were taken from you? Oh my God. Okay. The, source, the source material. Okay. But, but there, this leads to, while you're still um, on the line, Wilma, to I think what's an important question. So in, in the Northeast, we take brine, we put it in a truck, we send it down an injection well. Is it true, Wilma, that in the Gulf of Mexico, the brine that comes up is just discarded directly into the Gulf? All, all the production in the Gulf of Mexico has radioactivity, but nothing on the scale that you've got up in Pennsylvania. Okay, right. And I was just thinking, because there was there were some folks from Norway who I was recently in touch with who are doing a documentary. And when I started looking into produced water or brine in Norway, it became apparent, and this blew my mind, because Norway thinks, you know, regards itself as a very environmentally friendly country. They just put the brine right into the North Sea. Um, 
And in the Gulf of Mexico, EPA allows them to just put the produced water back into the Gulf. Yeah. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Um, are there any other questions in, uh, from uh, in the chat? Randy, do you know of any other questions? I love that visual and we, um, Justin, and we had one comment that why don't we educate the uh, workers in the fracking and oil industry that this is actually happening to their bodies? Uh, yeah, no, I think, you know, this, as I learn more, I, I have a tremendous concern for various points in the communities that are near this development, but I also have a lot of concern. Um, and the more I learn, the more, you know, I realize that it's in many cases, the worker who is gonna be most exposed. So this is something I think that should be done more. It is a, it, it's a delicate issue because in many areas in Ohio, fracking came around right when the recession was hitting and people just, they wanted a job. They wanted a trucking job, the job of hauling brine was such an exciting job. You're home at night, you don't have to do long hauls and, and miss being with your family. Um, there's a lot of perks to these jobs, um, but certainly many of these risks were not laid out. And I think, you know, that's a place where people can work at, and also disassemble, take apart this rift, right? That industry or administrations like the Trump administration tries to create between workers and the people who care about the environment. We clearly all care about the environment um, and, and, you know, it's really a false divide there. Okay. Um, Alice, you have a question? Um, hold on. You need to uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. That totally worked. Um, I have two questions. One, I have a question to um, Wilma. Do you feel like the radioactivity issue could be so sort of like long range and publicly capturing that it could stop the build out from happening like could that be enough of a difference between the situation we're in and the situation of the permian basin and the gulf coast and i had a question for justin had you looked at i just found this in the bulletin today which is the nuclear scientist magazine uh, from the since the manhattan project and they had a thing about war and the environment and they were talking about depleted uranium in tanks and munitions. And um, now the depleted munitions tanks are laying all around in southern Iraq and everyone's getting And I think it has parallels with your deal about the decommissioned equipment problem of the industry. I think it has um, some parallels. So a uh, question for each of you. So the, the different fractions that they separate from the natural gas have the potential to have the radioactivity in them and will go into the facility. And the facility will have to deal with this radioactive situation. But the issue is you will never see a, an inspector go out with a Geiger counter and equipment to measure and write them up by having too much radioactivity on the site. Um, yeah, or, and I guess was part of that question to Wilma, like, I don't know if you can come on this, well, well, comment on this Wilma, but like strategically, do you think radioactivity, because it's difficult, right? Some of the chemical names are difficult, but can radioactivity maybe capture the public's imagination and, and, and have a better chance of getting people con appropriately concerned about some of the projects? Yes, but it's not going to stop them. So just bear that in mind. It's important to educate them about what's going on, but it's not going to stop the project. Um, okay, yeah. And, 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 to the, and to the part of the question you directed at me, I think um, it, it's a really good point. So what, what and there, there's um, a history of this with the nuclear industry and um, I'm not, I'm aware of the research that you mentioned around um, depleted uranium in, um, 
in um, warheads, bullets, and things like that, but I haven't read all that research. So, but I know that it exists, and I think your point is really valid, which is that when there's a lot of waste, industry will come up with a way to try and rebrand it, whether it's lowering a limit so it's easier to put in a dump, or whether it's literally turning it into a product like we see happening in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania with brine. So absolutely, even if everything were to stop tomorrow um, and, and some wonderful new form of energy or the ones already here, you know, really start to take over and, and oil and gas is done, you still would have this waste and you would see um, a huge effort to try and, and convince us that whatever they decide to do with it is an appropriate thing and it's not gonna harm people. Uh, William and uh, uh, Wilma and Justin, you have been just awesome, but we are, well, we're out of time, like from like five, 10 minutes ago. So I'm going to let Randy close and please come back to us on Thursday. We will again have both of our speakers and we will be able to handle some of the questions that we were not able to get to at this time. So. Uh, Randy, it's all yours. Well, thank you both very much. This has been extremely informative and just reading some of the chat questions. I think people are shocked. I think they're shocked that um, the politicians and some of the people in the community still push these facilities and with all the health effects and the radioactivity. I mean, it's just, it's just like a cancer. It's floating on yeah. the landscape and and it's just really hard to understand how people can turn a blind eye to this so i just i just thank you guys so much for, for giving us all this information and we're really glad that it could be recorded and hopefully people will watch this and and spread the word and education is so key i mean we really need to educate people to what's going on because you know especially in our region the newspapers are always pro fossil fuels they, they, it's very hard to get any uh, airtime on the TV stations, radio stations, and, and letters to the editor in the newspaper. So thank, thank you both very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wilma. So we'll see you all on Thursday. Have a good evening. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation with everybody and meeting people on Thursday. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, Randy and Wilma and Justin and Alice and Mary and Brooke and BJ and everybody um, else. Kelsey. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.